Hi, I'm Wolf Nichols and this is Homegrown, a show all about gardening here in Newfoundland and Labrador. This week I'm off to Murray's Garden Centre in Portugal Cove where I'll be speaking with Renee Burry about the wide variety of gifts for gardeners. There's standard and innovative tools out there on the market and with new flowers, new tools, there's always something interesting. Newfoundland landscaper Mark Bowering will really make us take a second look at his garden. He's got almost a zen-like approach to his garden, with Japanese, Chinese and Indonesian influences, with Newfoundland plants in the mix. It really does make it well worth the visit. Debbie Preston will be here and she'll talk to us about anthracnose or leaf spot. It results in horrible brown discoloration of your plant leaves, but it can be easily dealt with if caught in the early stages. I'll be talking about native maple trees that are found along many of our walking trails. It's a beautiful tree to look at and I wonder why it's not more well used in our gardens. Well I'm sure you'll enjoy the show so stay tuned and we'll be right back. Hi and welcome back. You know, buying gifts for people is sometimes difficult. Christmas, birthdays, anniversaries. But if you've got a gardener in your life, buying is really easy. I'm at Murray's Garden Centre with Renee Burry. Thanks for taking the time to be with us today. Thanks for coming by. It's well, nice to have you. There's a million things you can buy a gardener. And when I think about uh, what I used to buy my dad, it was always a hand tool. And I think the, most, the best hand tool you can give a gardener is a good pair of pruners. True, it is. So show us a few. Well, we have pruners and they come in all different price ranges. Uh, anywhere from $12.99 to in the $70 range would be some of these. Well, that, means, that, that one's been around the block a few times. Yes, it is. And <laughs> they, uh, you pay a little bit more for what you get. Uh, right. It's a, a good quality pruner. This is uh, one of the Swiss pruners. Yes it is indeed. That's yes. great. Now I have to tell you a story about one of these. I used to have, well I still do have a pair of Swiss pruners and I lost mine for a whole year and then one time I was in the uh, compost heap mm -hmm. and I found it. It was still sharp and I put it straight back to use. Yes. Uh, and yet um, some of the cheaper ones probably aren't as strong. That's true. Uh, a lot of times the construction is just not there. The blade quality, the steel quality is not there. So, you know, you do pay for what you get. It's, it's true. Well, one of the problems I find with these expensive pruners is they're just as easy to lose as the cheap ones. That's true. Now, for those pruners, we do have a little case that you can put on your belt. And right. whenever you're finished, you just you know, put your pruners right into the back like, there, slide like a them holster. in. And yeah, and they they usually stay with you for yep. a season. Anyway. Well, yeah, unless you're like <laughs> you like me. So. But um, now, those seem like silly little pruners. What are those? Those are great for like out in the garden, out in the garden for doing cut flowers, uh, right, like coming course. in and doing arrangements. Uh, and I do that. Yeah. That's and, and they're perfect. great for that. They're tiny so you can get in there and clip those tiny little flower buds off if you're going to use those to stick in the sides. That's and, a great idea. You know. Okay and then um, and then what are these? These look uh, rather these painful. are great too because a lot of times you're in an area where you're not uh, you can't get a gas mower or you can't get electricity so you can always take a pair of these little grass shears and right. go in and do your little bit of clipping work that you need so they're great when you need if you're going up to the cottage or something and you don't want to pack a gas mower with you so you can take those and do a little handy work so good that's a good little tool now what else we got now trowels are great for for planting but um that one's an interesting this one. This is great because it's for a person who has like an osteoarthritis problem or right. rheumatoid where the flexibility is not there in the hands anymore. Oh. And you don't need a whole lot of flexibility to hold on to this and to dig in the ground where the other way you're grabbing hold and you're pulling back on the joints yes, and yes. muscles. Where these, it's a whole lot easier to dig into the soil. So. Right. Whoever came up with this little invention, great idea. it's great for those people. But I tell you now, um, I got this from elsewhere, but one of my favorite tools is this one. Now, it, it looks like I'm mountaineering. I'm going to go up a glacier or something <laughs> like this. But uh, this is like a little mattock. And um, what I do is I just like, I can plant annuals with this. 
Mm -hmm. and push it back, I can cultivate, I can stab things, I can uh, defend myself, I can do all sorts of things with this one. It's a great little tool. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's move on. Uh, rather larger ones here, uh, pair of loppers. Yes, and they're great because they have a ratchet mechanism in them. Now look at that, that's a ratchet and so you can further apart or further apart or further apart so there's a great deal of strength in there yes so That's you great. don't always have to apply the strength yourself because each time you cut it sort of bites in there and holds it and you don't have to force things as much as you usually would excellent good stuff and um what else we got um now that again looks like a very useful little tool great little pruning saw uh, you know I've got numerous pruning saws at home and I've always got one packed on me somewhere because yep. you're always cutting off little branches, uh, you know, pruning up when you see a, when you see a, a, a shrub that might have a broken you know, branch right. or something. So it's always great to have that in your little gardening apron as you're going around. And, and of it's course, folds away. Right. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it folds yeah. away nicely. Another holster maybe. Yeah. And the uh, thing about a pruning saw is it cuts on the drawer instead of the push and so you get a really nice clean cut what a great little tool that is well super um last one i want to tell you about is this one i um this used to be a favorite tool of mine it's a long handled straight spade mm -hmm. or shovel and what i like about this one is you can use it for a million things if you sharpen it you can edge a lawn with it mm -hmm. uh and um and it's easy on the back Great. True. Yeah. You know, not so much stooping with that one. Not so much stooping at all. That's super. Okay. Um, what else we got here? Now, that looks. Uh, what's that for? That must be. Great gardening wire. You can use that to tie up your tomatoes, your clematis, uh, anything. Anything that's broken and needs tying up, you can use that. And I like twist ties. You can have yes. any any sort of uh, any sort of size and again, twist tie. This is it's great too because you can just need to, the push on this little spot here, and it just clips your great. wire for you. So that is, you know, you can pull off a two foot section if you want, or a, or a one inch piece. Because I always take the twist ties out of the bag of garbage yes. bags, and I'm like putting yeah. them together to get long ones and yes. everything. That's super. Yeah. And of course string, you can't get more simple than that. That's true. And again, it's versatile in the garden for making uh, little uh, twig arbors and tying those together to tying again, tomatoes, any type of vine, well, just we, about anything. We've hardly got around the store at all and we've yes. already found a load of things for people to use in their gardens. Great gifts of gardeners. Renee, thanks for showing us around. It's been a great well, pleasure. Thank you for coming by. It was great having you here. Well, yeah. lots of ideas and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Isn't this beautiful? I'm in a garden on the east side of St. John's and it's the garden of Mark Bowering. And as soon as I walked into the garden, I saw this beautiful little water feature. And uh, this is a um, real focus uh, for this uh, garden, but there's other things I wanna see in this garden too. Mark, thanks for inviting Thank us you. in. Now, you are a Landscape Newfoundland Labrador member, yes, sir. and you are a landscaper here in St. John's. Yes. Tell us about your business. How long have you been in business? Well, we started three years ago, and it kind of started off small, but uh, things are starting to get bigger. Really into doing a lot of water features and ponds. Right. Uh, foundation right. beds for houses and shrubs and perennials, brickwork. So you can do all there. sorts of things, but, yeah. uh, but really, we're not that far away from the airport. No. You can't hear anything but bubbling water. It's beautiful. And I need you to tell us about this because it's so simple and so effective. Yep. It's uh, simply just the ground is dug out below in a basin and this pot is placed on a milk crate right. um, upside down. And the pump sits down below this pot here in the uh, basin of water and it just recirculates water over and over again. Really? Yep. So it's all the water's coming out, it's just going back into the pump and then coming up through? Yes. And you've got some uh, rounded beach rocks here, it's uh, it really is effective. Yeah, I really yeah. like it. Well, congratulations. You know, um, the reason we came here in the first place is because you have a real liking for, and I know you've got a beautiful little uh, Asian or Japanese type garden. Yes, yep, it's just over here. 
Can we go see? Sure. Okay. Lead, lead on. Take a look. This is beautiful in here, Mark. And what I can't get over is how small it is. It, mm. it must be what, ten by ten? Yeah, maybe ten by twelve, even. Not much wow. bigger than that at all. It's gorgeous. And um, tell me, why is this not a Japanese garden? Well, I'd probably call it an Asian influence garden. There's a lot of different aspects of Asian gardening here. Yeah. One of them is a circle here. Right. Kind of Chinese influence. Um, and then we've got our Asian Buddha. Okay. And Indonesian, sorry. But then the, the beautiful blue atlas cedar in mm -hmm. the pot by the bamboo, that's got to be Japanese. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and just the way I kind of have it styled with the supports, the Japanese supports. And what, what I love in here is, well, I love the simplicity. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful, but it's simple. There's, there's not that many plants in here. No. The point is to keep it reduced and not have it overgrown. Right. Um, and plants in pots always look better. Right. So we've got that blue um, cedar, and then what's what's this one here? It's uh, Deodora cedar. Oh, right. Cedrus Deodora. Yes, Cedrus Deodora. That is, um, that's not quite hardy here, is it? No, but I keep it in the greenhouse in the over green. the winter. Right, but just, it uh, yeah, it doesn't need to be heated, but just to protect it from the snow and ice. Okay. And you were telling me about this, uh, this boardwalk or this bridge. Mm -hmm. uh, that is Japanese style? Yeah. And it's, why would it, what makes it Japanese? It's just kept simple without use of nails on top. Um, the boards are all secured from below. Nice straight lines. Yes. And, um, not complicated. Wow, wow. And I have a little water feature and uh, and a gravel beach. I think beaches are very important yeah. in Asian uh, yeah. horticulture or Asian design, isn't it? They are, for sure. And this is great too for when the birds want to come down. They can walk right into the water. Right. And you see them here off in the mornings. Do you? And flapping their wings. And they love it. Um, I see five rocks on their ends over there. What, is, is that significant? Well, numbers three, five, and seven are significant in Asian gardening. You don't want to go two or four. Um, certainly, you can see like there's, there's five rocks there and three here and different groups of three as well throughout. I see, yeah. And uh, the bench, um, now that's got to be a bit of Newfoundland stone. Yeah, it's from Deer Lake. It's Deer Lake stone. Right. And uh, it's not finished this the way I kind of wanted it to be. Um, rough looking simple just a slab of stone sitting on rocks wow so. it's so effective it's so tranquil and as i say we're we're in the east part of uh of st john's uh you think you'd hear traffic and airplanes and yet you get this trickling of water down on the on the buddha there the other wonderful water feature we saw uh we've got a beautiful water lily here um that looks uh, even like the native one. Yeah, it? it is. Yeah, it is the native one. Is it? Yeah, and it grows quite well in here and very hardy. I mean, this freeze is solid in the winter time. Yeah. It doesn't matter at all. It's perfect. That's that's great. Yeah. So we've got uh, it, it's it's like fusion cookery. It's like yeah. we got uh, we got Asian influence. We've got native stuff, and shading us all is a good old native dogberry. Yeah. Uh, instead of like a, a prunus or a, one of these uh, yeah. Chinese or Japanese cherries. It's and a beautiful bit of work. They're really hardy here as well. They'd be great. Yeah. yeah you yeah. don't need to worry about it. It's not going to crack off in the winter. Well, congratulations. It's a beautiful little garden. Thanks so much for showing me and uh, good luck with the landscaping Thank industry. Thank you. Mark, thanks. Here's a plant you don't see too often. Uh, in fact, I haven't seen it grown so well in Newfoundland, um, well, since I've been here. Uh, we used to see this quite a bit in uh, Vancouver. The plant is called Rhodochiton purpurea. Uh, long name, it's a Mexican or a Central American plant, uh, and it's in the foxglove family, and it's a climbing plant, certainly not hardy here, but a great tender annual uh, to put into a uh, like a teepee or even in a hanging basket. It's called Mexican hat vine and beautiful little bells and that have this wonderful dark dark purple flower. So this is the flower but even after the flower is finished 
uh, you get left with this little light purple bell. And so the whole of the plant is covered in these light purple bells or the old calices. Uh, and then uh, the dark purple flower is there for a short time. It's a beautiful little delicate vine. It doesn't take on a great deal of weight. It's not going to pull any trellis down. You can put it in a hanging basket. You can put it on a trellis. Uh, you can even put it in a uh, maybe a, even a window box. It likes the sunshine. It's not hardy. It'll come back from seed or you can do it from cuttings. But maybe have a little look in the uh, seed manuals or the seed catalogues that you get every winter and uh, try your luck with Rhodochitin purpurea or the Mexican hat plant. Welcome back. Well, now we're off to Debbie Preston's house and she'll show us another houseplant problem. So, over to you, Debbie. Today I'd like to talk about a common problem that happens on all different types of houseplants. It's called anthracnose and it's basically like a leaf spot. It's caused by a lot of different organisms, uh, fungi actually. And uh, you can see by looking closely at this silver queen, this Aglaonema silver queen, that you get tan or brown spots starting to develop, uh, little yellow margins, margins around them. As they develop, they kind of coalesce together and you get bigger spots uh, developing. On this leaf, you can see some of the larger spots all growing together as they get bigger and larger. Uh, this is on the top of the plant, but it tends to be worse underneath, on the lower leaves. And if you go down and have a look down here, this leaf is really badly infected. Once it gets so large, it almost gets sort of water soaked. Um, the leaf has just gone totally yellow and it's starting to die back. It's a common fun fungi that is in the soil. Often when you're watering, it can, the soil can splash up on the leaves. It needs that moisture uh, on the leaf to infect it. And it just sort of spreads throughout the plant. It's not a, an easy thing to control uh, once you get it. It's mostly, like I said, better air circulation, air movement, cleaning up the plant using clean pruners and just snipping off the dead leaves uh, will help reduce it, making sure that you're, when you're watering you're not splashing the leaves from the soil. I'm going to clean up the plant, remove all this dead tissue. Make sure you use sterile soil when you're potting up your house plants. So you're not using uh, just soil straight out of the garden. Make sure that you use sterile soil or a commercial potting soil that you buy in the store. Remove all this dead tissue. Make sure you, you um, sterilize your pruners when you're done because you don't want to take these and use them on another plant and spread it around. Clean up the plant. Remove any of those dead leaves and the spotted leaves from above, clip those off as well. And that also helps with air movement throughout the plant. The uh, air can now get through the plant a little bit better and watch your watering. And that should help um, reduce the incidence of anthracnose on your plant. If you do want to use or have to use a chemical, you would have to take the plant outside. It's not something that we recommend that you do in the house. There's no chemicals uh, available that you can use inside in the house. Sulfur or benamil or chlorothalonol are products that you could probably pick up, but again, you'd want to take the plant outside in the summer, spray it down, make sure it's well dried. You might have to leave it out in the shed or in the shade outside for a day or so before you bring it back in. And again, you wouldn't want to have it around children or pets, anything that's been sprayed with a chemical like that. So pruning is the best way to deal with anthracnose on your house plants very easy problem to control and you can still have beautiful houseplants in your home. Thank you. Thanks Debbie, great advice for houseplant lovers. Now outside there are maple trees and I'm going to show you a few native trees that really demand a place in your garden. Well isn't this a beautiful tree? It's a maple tree and it's a native red maple native to Newfoundland, Labrador, and across the eastern part of Canada and down into the States. 
It's funny, this is such a beautiful tree and yet most of the maples in our gardens tend to be Norway maples or sycamore maples that are not native. Here in the province we have two native maples, this beautiful red maple tree and also the mountain maple which is somewhat larger. It's a great tree in having beautiful smooth bark, the leaves might color up yellow or they might color up red and it really depends whether it gets more sun or less sun and whether it's in a wetter spot or a drier spot. But you won't see red maples in the native habitats around St. John's. You've got to get off the Avalon. As you get off the Avalon and start getting into Terra Nova National Park you'll start to see red maples in amongst the other a flora there and, and in the fall of course they are just a shining red uh, plant in there and you'll find this plant right the way across the island after you get off the Avalon. Beautiful plant, likes just normal well drained soil, get it in the sunshine and you'll get much better coloration. But it's a great native plant, use it in your gardens and have a change from the Norway maple, okay? Well, that's our show for this week, but next week we'll be dealing with fall gardening chores. I'll be speaking to Carl White, the head gardener at Munn Botanical Garden. He's been there for 18 years and he has a large amount of information to pass on to us all. Simple tasks done in the fall will save a lot of work in the springtime. So he's going to show us how to cut back some flowers, protect those apple trees and many other plants. Simple precautions go such a long way if they're done right. Debbie Preston will talk about those plants that give us so much pleasure in our backyard in the summer, but they can be brought in for the winter. There are some simple ground rules that should be observed. I'll talk about the native red twig. It's a plant that's found on many of the trailways, but it looks especially attractive in the fall. It's well worth going on a nature walk to see the red twig. Well, I hope you enjoyed the show and we'll see you next week.